If you'd like to open up to Daniel chapter 9, we're looking today at the rapture of the church and the great tribulation. Some light reading for you today, um, but uh, there is often a lot of confusion around these subjects. And with all that's going on in our world today, people are asking these questions, and we would like to look at them and see how our Lord answers these questions that may be swirling in your mind uh, today as well. So uh, if you'll open up to Daniel chapter 9, you can hold your place there and open up to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, and I'm doing the same. There's, like I said, lots of places to... Uh, turn to today. If you want to listen in instead of turning, that's fine too. You can go back and study them for homework. It is good to see people in church. It is good to fellowship. Behold how blessed it is for brethren and sistren. <laughs> <laughs> to dwell together in unity. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Amen. Amen. Glad to see y'all here. It's really good to see Aoife today. For those who aren't here, you're gonna, I'm going to make you jealous. Aoife is here and Manny and Brianna. But Aoife is here. <laughs> and she is lovely. She's looking nice and chunky today. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> That's right. She's like, you talk about me. That's great. She's got a little, little pout. There you go. <laughs> Turn that frown upside down. There you go, Mama. <laughs> Daddy, it was a good try, but Mama really did it. She... <laughs> All the time. I know it. I understand. All right. Well, if you found your place there, again, we're going to be at other places as well, but we're going to start there. Um, so with that, uh, Let's, uh, let's look at God's word together. You know, with all the unrest in our nation and all the suffering in this world, our minds naturally shift to questions about the last days. What is going on? First, we have pandemic. Now we got all, the un all this unrest in major cities. What is going on? Are these current events a signal that the end of the world is upon us, upon us, upon us? You know, and maybe you have that, you know, sleepless nights or toss and turn and you worry, and you watch too much news and you click and click. And it's like, ah, the anxiety, the fear, the stuff that's on our minds and hearts these days surfaces questions like, what is the great tribulation? And when will that be? Are we entering into days of great tribulation? When will the rapture be? Will we be here during the great tribulation? Depending on what you've watched or read or maybe the church background you grew up in, that will determine kind of where you land on those very important questions. Well, did you know that there is a prophetic timeline in the Word of God? There is a prophetic timeline in the Word of God. In the Scriptures, we have answers to the sequence of events in the last days. And so we're going to look at some of that today. Again, like I said, light reading for us today. Uh, we may not get through all of it, but Lord willing, we'll get through what he has in mind for us to cover, all right? So let me start and let you know that this is not the end of the world. That's right, Aoife. Aoife got an amen there. Thank you, ma'am. Good to have you back. And how can you say that, Pastor? How can you say that it's not the end of the world? Well, because the end of the world will be signaled by the Battle of Armageddon, and that is not currently happening. Okay, so we know it's, this is not that not the end of the world. So let's look today at the prophetic timeline for these last days. We'll start out by when is the Great Tribulation? I'm not going to give a date. Don't worry. But we are going to look at what the Bible says in Daniel 9 about that. So let's look at Daniel 9 together. We're going to pick it up, and we're looking at Daniel's 70 weeks. Verse 24. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. And then it gives the reason that 70 weeks have been determined. What have these 70 weeks been determined for? And by the way, the 70 weeks here, I'll go ahead and tell you so you understand better. These are 70 weeks of weeks. This is measured in years, 70 weeks of years. In other words, 490 years. That's the timeline we're looking at. There's a 490-year time period that this is talking about, 490 years. You think, well, this is written a lot longer than 490 years ago. Stay tuned. We'll talk about that. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people for and, for and your holy city. And then there are several things mentioned 
in verse 24. Number one, to finish the transgression. To finish the transgression, it says. In other words, to end the apostasy that they were seeing. To end the apostasy. Apostasy is false teaching. It is uh, heresy. Apostasy. Apostate is where we get that word. Um, false teaching, heresy that's been in the church throughout the ages. So seven weeks have been determined to finish that transgression. Number two, to make an end of sin. That's a nice verse, isn't it? It may mean either to atone for sin or to seal up sin in the sense of judging it finally. To make an end of sin, to the final judgment. It's probably what it's alluding to, the end of time as we know it in the beginning of eternity. And then it says to make atonement for iniquity. And that refers to the death of Christ on the cross. The basis of future at this time, Israel's future redemption, the basis of our current redemption, looking backwards at the cross, they were redeemed in faith by something that hadn't happened yet, faith in the blood of the animals, pointing to, of course, Jesus, who is pictured in all those animal sacrifices. So again, to make atonement for iniquity refers to the death of Christ on the cross. At this time, not happened yet. Looking forward, now is us looking back. And then it says, to bring in everlasting righteousness in the millennial kingdom of Messiah is what that's talking about. Everlasting righteousness and into eternity. So the millennial kingdom, a thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth, the new heavens and the new earth, the holy city, new Jerusalem, a whole nother study, but uh, a beautiful picture of what we will see in Christ in that thousand year reign with him. And then it says, to seal up vision, and prophecy. In other words, to set God's seal of fulfillment on all the prophecies concerning the Jewish people and Jerusalem. To set God's seal of fulfillment on all the prophecies. To seal up vision and prophecy. To, to wrap it all up. All the prophecies that were given will be wrapped up in that 490 year period. And then it says, and to anoint the most holy place. The anointing of the holy of holies in the millennial temple, there will be a temple, Jesus, the son of God himself. And so the anointing of the Holy of Holies in the, in the millennial temple. And so a beautiful picture there of what we see that um, has happened and will happen, both wrapped, wrapped up in that one verse. So you are to know and to discern that from the issuing of a decree, so in other words, the question, he gets into answering the question, when is this going to happen? When is this 490 years? So you were to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. And if you add up all those weeks of years, that's 483 years, 490, the total, minus Seven, we're talking about that seven year period, is 483. The 483 is accounted for in verse 25. Seven weeks plus 62 weeks of years, if you're doing weeks of years, seven weeks of years is 49, right? Seven times seven. Well, 62 times seven is whatever that is, but you add them together, it's 483. <laughs> Time math, I can't do that in my head. 483 is the total weeks of years they're talking about. What is that talking about? You were to know and discern from the issuing of a decree, the issuing of a decree. Well, there were a decree to rebuild and restore, restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The commandment of Artaxerxes Longimanus was given in 445 BC to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. That decree was given. Earlier, Cyrus had authorized the rebuilding of the temple with plaza and moat. The public square were built about that time in the first seven weeks of years, 49 years, they were completed. So again, bottom line, they had a decree to rebuild to 49 years. And then there's another time that we have just the span of time. We're going to see what, what fulfills that time. So these weeks of years, a decree is given. That's the main thing I want you to remember. A decree is given to rebuild Jerusalem. So in other words, there's, he's saying, that's when you start counting time for the fulfillment of this prophecy. At the time that the decree is given. So don't worry about all those numbers. Scratch that for a minute. Okay. Uh, I'll come back to it. But it's, it gets confusing there. So um, 
the main thing is when that decree was given, that's when the clock started ticking, all right, for the fulfillment and when Messiah the Prince would make atonement for sin. That's the key. So here it continue. It'll be built again with plaza and moat, even times of distress. Verse 26, then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Okay, stop there. So in verse 26, it says, it says the people will be cut off. It says Messiah, after, after 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. 62 weeks. So we've got the uh, seven-week period, the 49 years, restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That's how long it took. And then you add 62 weeks. So you add 62 and 7 is what? Y'all can do that math in your head. 69, right? 69 weeks of years. You do times 7, that's 483. We got that. Now, the years were calculated on a 365, uh, pardon me, a 360 day year, not 365. That was later when it was uh, reconfigured. And it's 365 when they figured out, wait a minute, we got, we got a miscalculation. Well, this was based on a 360-day year. That's what they believed a year was. Okay? They hadn't gotten the, the science around 365 yet. So you got 69 weeks of years times 7. So 69 weeks times 7 years is 483. Times, if you multiply that, times 360. That's how, much, how many days are in a year. You get 173,880 170, days. Now, watch this. If you start the clock ticking at the, at the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and you go forward 173,880 days, that is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey as our Savior. Holy ghost bumps, right? I mean, isn't that amazing? That's, that's God. That's his perfect timing, and that's him fulfilling prophecy. He knows the end from the beginning. There is no time doesn't constrain him. He lives in eternity and he is determined. He tells Daniel, gives him a little insight. And he says, now watch this. I'm going to tell you how this is going to go down. He tells him exactly to the day the Messiah, the Prince will come and make atonement, make an end to, to sin. It says in verse 24, to make atonement for iniquity. It says there to bring in everlasting righteousness will come later. So the first two phrases there in verse 24 make an end to sin, to finish the transgression, to make an end to sin, first three phrases, make atonement for iniquity. Beautiful. So we understand that, that those things in the first 483 years have happened. Uh-oh, I thought it was 490. I thought, where is that missing week? We're, we're missing something here. That week is suspended in the interest of the age of grace or the, um, the time where God has chosen not to hold man's sin against them, if you will. In other words, God, anybody can come, whosoever, we looked at that last week, whosoever will may come and receive grace and forgiveness and forgiveness of sin and salvation in Christ and eternity in their hearts. That's the age. So, so that's the the, uh, the book ends to the age of grace right now, or what we just looked at in the beginning of the Great Tribulation. This age we're in, these thousands of years that we're in, a couple of thousand years now, we're waiting for the Great Tribulation. And after the Great Tribulation, seven years, we'll begin the thousand-year reign with Christ. So, if you look at Matthew 24, that'll give us some more insight as to where that, uh, that seven years comes in and how the tribulation. So the next question I guess people ask would be, okay, does this mean the rapture is going to happen soon? Let's look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Verse 36. Before we read that, the question is, 
when is the rapture going to happen? Some people are saying it's going to happen soon. Some say it's never going to happen. Of course, Peter comments on that. The, the critics who say, where is the promise of his coming? It's been so long. And he comes responds with God is not slow concerning his promise. He's going to fulfill his promises and so forth and so on, right? Verse 36 in Matthew 24. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So if you hear somebody say, I know when the rapture is going to be. <laughs> I know when it's going to happen. Refer them to that verse. Even Jesus doesn't know when it's going to happen. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days, which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. So the ark, by the way, is a type of Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. The ark of the covenant is a picture of Jesus, and Noah's ark is a picture of Jesus. The, that he, and a picture of us, too, in the ark. But the, the, the ark, the holy of holies, in there, the Aaron's rod that budded, the manna, uh, the showbread, and the word, the, ten, the testament, the Ten Commandments, picture of Jesus. So... As in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And some say, well, doubt the rapture is going to happen like any minute now because things aren't, people are kind of looking for it now. The church is actually saying, okay, this, this could be it, right? This, this well, it says here that things are going to kind of be as normal. This would indicate that things might return to normal, quote unquote, whatever that may look like after this, right? And then everything, oh, good, everything's back to normal. And maybe, the church lets her guard down or whatever, and then the Lord calls us home. We can't be too presumptive on that. He could call us home at any time, at any moment. You know, be on, your, on, on the lookout, if you will, as the word says. It says, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And it took them all away in, in Genesis there with the flood of Noah to judgment. And so it will be the judgment in the end times. Then there shall be two, two men healed. One will be taken, the other left behind. And the taken there is to be with Christ, by the way. Two men will be working, grinding at the mill. One will be taken away to be with Christ and the other left behind. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Be, but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you be ready to, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So again, that would indicate that well, we're thinking he may come now. Well, actually, it says he may not come now because we're thinking he will come now. So if you want him to come now, say, oh, he's not going to come now, and then he'll come. <laughs> so that's the key. There's the secret right there. We want Jesus to take us home. Y'all stop thinking he'll take us home, and he'll take us home. That's a good solution, right? Let's all do, can we all agree on that? Let's, let's just let's all let's all do that. Oh, and by the way, when we're raptured, and, and what we're looking at here too is okay, you've got the, the day of the Lord, the rapture, the coming of the Lord. There's 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 a difference in these things. The Lord is going to take his church at a time we least expect. Whoop, we're out of here. Reptus, harpazo. Different words, reptus in the Latin, harpazo in the Greek. The word harpoon, where we get the harpazo from, they're snatched very quickly, okay? It's one instant you're here, next minute you're not. You blink your eyes, boom, that's how quick it'll be. It's not like we're going to look up and see Jesus coming. That's not the rapture. That's the day of the Lord. That's the second coming of Christ. And those events are separated, I believe, prophetically, by seven years. And so it's at any moment that we see... Um, the rapture of the church when we're not thinking it'll happen <laughs> but then after a seven-year period of tribulation when we're in, the, in heaven with the lord and we'll look at that too we're going to be with him then the day of the lord we come with him we come with him on the day of the lord to bring those tribulation saints home those who got saved during the tribulation oh and by the way when we're raptured we'll get new bodies that will never perish no expiration dates. <laughs> no expiration dates at all. I was looking at a, a, a creamer uh, this morning, and I was looking for the expiration date, and it was nowhere on there. I smelled it. smelled fine. And I was thinking, where's the expiration dates? Where, where? It had no expiration. And I think it might have been on the label that you take off, the, the, the plastic that's on the top. And 
I think they need to put it on the thing that you don't take it off. Just my opinion, because I don't really like sniffing if it's going to be bad. It's like, oh, you know. But isn't it good to know that we won't have expiration dates? These bodies have expiration dates. <laughs> have you noticed? <laughs> As you get older, you, you notice that they're, they don't move like they used to. Uh, but our new bodies will not have expiration dates. They will live forever. In 1 Corinthians 15, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So these bodies are not the ones that will be going to heaven. These bodies, that's why it's okay for us to be buried in the ground or cremated. Cremation just speeds up the process. Just in case you're wondering, is it okay? Biblically, it's okay. It just speeds up the process, that which takes nature, a certain time, fire, just expedites. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable, right? Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. That is a wonderful verse to put on the nursery door at every church in the world, by the way, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. <laughs> they need, and in fact, I think that ought to be orthodox. I think every church needs to be required to put that on the door of the changing room, of the, of the baby room, the toddler, whatever. We'll not all sleep, but we will all be changed. <laughs> That's not what this means, of course. <laughs> what that means is that some of us are going to go to sleep in death and be resurrected. With Jesus, by the way, let me, let me explain that part, okay? Let me do a little side note because there's a lot of stuff here. Told you I was going to try to get it done. We'll see. Those who have died before us were with Jesus right when they closed their eyes in this life. If they were in Christ, of course. If they're in Christ. They're with the Lord. There's no such thing as soul sleep. There's no, there's no delay. There's no unconsciousness. There's always consciousness. That's why eternity is such a heavy matter. That's why we need to make sure that we have assurance of our salvation. We're relying on Christ and Christ alone and his finished work on the cross and not anything that we can do or have done that gives us gold stars on our holy halo. When someone dies, they are with the Lord. Their body goes into the ground, deteriorates, or is cremated, whatever. And at verse, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, we will all be changed. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, that's when the perishable takes on imperishable. So it says those who some will not all sleep, will not all die, but we will all be changed. The changing is getting the new bodies. Some will get their new bodies from the molecules that are wherever they're dispersed, and they'll come together with a new body. Some of us will go straight from this body living to the new body with the Lord. Okay, is that clear as mud? <laughs> Hopefully that's clear. But it says, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. So the dead go from perishable to imperishable. When the trumpet sounds and we will be changed so the dead will go from perishable to imperishable we will be trans transformed translated if you will also getting our new bodies but this perishable must put on imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality that's what happens when you die or when the rapture happens the lord gives paul and us some insight into when the rapture will take place as it relates to when the Antichrist comes onto the scene in his second letter to the church at Thessalonica. So if you'd like to turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Y'all having fun? Yeah? Good, good. Second Thessalonians, this is this is uh this is good stuff. And again, remember, in light of current events. We look at these things, like, what's going on, what's happening, and so forth. It's good to know what the Word says about all this stuff, isn't it? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, different events, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message of a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica a second letter because the first letter was misunderstood because people came in and started making them think the day of the Lord happened and they were left behind. Even way back then when the church was brand spanking new, there was already false teaching coming in. Apostasy has always been around. And so he counters that with his second letter. He says, I don't want you to be shaken, disturbed, 
anxious. And that's a good word for us today. Don't be shaken, disturbed, anxious. The day of the Lord is going to happen on God's perfect timetable. Just as it happened at the cross of Christ, so it will happen at the second advent of Christ. As it happened to the first, it'll happen to the second. He is always right on time. Let no one, here it goes, in any way deceive you. For it, that is the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed from the Lord Pardon me, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. I love that. The Lord will slay Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. He'll just say, you're done. And that's it. And bring an end, bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the power and activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. So at his second coming, the Lord will do away with Antichrist. This man of sin, it says, man of lawlessness, it says in verse 3. He's called the son of perdition in verse 3, or the son of destruction, it says in my translation. The Antichrist, he is apostate. He is a false teacher. Is currently being restrained. He may be on the scene now. He may be alive and well in this world now, yet not revealing himself, because we, knowing the Bible, as Christians, would say, hey, there he is. We are the ones, in verse 6, it says, you know what restrains him now. That's the Holy Spirit, the restrainer. It's called the restrainer. He restrains things, keeps things in order, keeps things from going crazy. The presence of the church in the world right now, the presence of the Holy Spirit and the people of God is the restrainer, the restraining force on the forces of darkness in the world is in the body of Christ right now. Verse seven, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, that's the Holy Spirit. He who now restrains in us and through us. You may not even be aware that the Holy Spirit is doing a restraining work through you. You don't sense that. You don't, you don't have to have this, you know, this supernatural, rather this ecstatic experience for the Lord to be using you and the Holy Spirit within you. But let's go back to verse three. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy. Apostasy there means rebellion. Apostasy means rebellion. It means falling away. Rebellion, falling away. It also means departure. A departure. So what this is saying in verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So the apostasy, if if there's a falling away, a great falling away in the church, but there's also, there's the meaning there also is a departure, apostasia. Apostasia, 12 or 15 times is used. It means an actual departure from. This could refer to the rapture rather than an actual revolt against God. It could mean both. So there will be a revolt against God. There will be a falling away. There already is aggression uh, worldwide against the things of God. The cross of Christ, the name of Jesus, is offensive. And the apostasia, that's the, the actual transliteration of the word. It's where we sometimes a Greek word is translated into English. Um, And we use almost the exact word. It's apostasia in Greek. It's apostasy in English. Uh, The definition of apostasy is a deliberate abandonment of a position that was held, a defection. So we know that there is a falling away from the truth. The gospel has been watered down in these times. Have you noticed? If you've you've clicked uh, on cable and seeing some of the teaching that's out there, the gospel, the cross of Christ isn't even mentioned. The truth 
of the gospel of Christ and how someone can be saved is not even mentioned. It's greasy grace, sloppy, sloppy agape, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> you want to call it. But it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's not the truth. And so there is, there is already apostasy that's happening, but the apostasy, that definite article there in verse three is key. So make a note of that. It says the apostasy. This person that it's speaking of here, this man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, he will come in a time of great political upheaval. The Antichrist, the man of perdition, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness will come in a time of great political upheaval. I wanted to repeat that. <laughs> I think we might even be being primed for a time of great political upheaval. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, by the way, Antichrist, yes, it means against Christ, but it also means instead of Christ. Anti more accurately means instead of Christ. This person is not going to have horns and a red cape. This person is going to be very charming, very handsome. He will present himself uh, as, the, as a, the solution to the world's problems. He'll be witty. He'll be brilliant. He'll be diplomatic. He'll be a military genius. He will be so influential that he will hold sway over the people of the earth. Do you think they would vote for him if he didn't have that, those kind of characteristics? If he showed his true colors? No. Satan comes as a deceiver, and he will come incarnate as a deceiver. He will look wonderful. There will be those who've been in church all their lives who will be deceived by this Antichrist. He will hold sway over the people of the earth. But before that time comes, there is an event that will happen first, the rapture. Because again, if he were to come on the scene... Especially as it says midway through the tribulation, it says that he's going to take his place midway through the tribulation, three and a half years in, and he's going to exalt himself as the one who is to be worshipped. And if that definitely happens, we're going to say, wait a minute, foul, time out, that's the Antichrist. We're not going to be here to say that. We will be with the Lord, not here. So the apostasy, again, falling away from the faith, yes, it means a falling away. It means a departure from faith, but it also means a being snatched, a pulling away from this earth. Apostasia. There's always been apostasy in varying degrees throughout church history. Again, even Paul had to address that right here in this fledgling church. There's always been apostasy. There's always been a falling away in false teaching that has been present to varying degrees throughout church history. But God has always countered these seasons of falling away, if you look at church history, with revival, with great awakenings. He's always countered when the world or a nation started really getting moral decay. He followed with a great awakening. And that's why I believe that we very well may be on the heels of a great awakening. And church, I believe that that's going to happen before the rapture, because I believe God loves people so much that he's going to leave us here to tell people about him. As things get harder or darker, we'll say, I have hope in Jesus. Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you how you can know him. But here's the thing. Remember the definite article in verse three. We have yet to see the apostasy. We have not yet seen the, we've seen apostasy. We've seen falling away from the truth throughout church history. We've not seen the great apostasy, the great falling away, the great rebellion. At that point, the church is removed when the great apostasy comes. So there's no reviving. There's no turning back the tide of deception. God has used the church, the body of Christ universal, to, to, to spark these uh, great revivals and awakenings. But we won't be here when the apostasy comes. So we are either right now in the apostasy, 
And we're starting to see the apostasy right now. And there's a great awakening around the corner. Or God is about to take us out of here. One of those two things. We're either right here in the middle of a lot of rebellion and anti-Christ behavior in the man of sin. The stage is being set, again, all under the authoritative hand of God. That's why I love the worship songs we had this morning about God's authority over all these things. And we're going to see a great awakening before our very eyes and be a part of it. Have Just be so blessed to be a part of the final revival before the rapture, or the Lord may choose to call us home. The only thing we're waiting for right now, by the way, before the rapture is the fullness of the Gentiles. There's the fullness of the Gentiles that happens during the age of grace. In other words, the last Gentile to be saved, fullness of Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles, the last Gentile to be saved. And then there's a time, the seven-year period tribulation is also called the, called the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a time where Israel will be persecuted. There'll be 144,000. You've heard that number among the Jehovah's Witnesses. The correct interpretation of that is there'll be 144,000 Jewish evangelists, <laughs> Jewish Billy Grahams, if you will. And they will go about and tell people about Jesus, the Messiah, their Messiah. God is not done with the Jews. He's not done with the nation of Israel. He will use them mightily. He's using them now. and He used them mightily in that time of great tribulation. He will tell about Messiah. Just like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who cared for Jesus' body after he was crucified, they saw it then. So many of their brothers and sisters will see it during the tribulation period and tell people about Jesus. Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm hurrying. I know I should probably just go through the same thing next week, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 13. It'll sound familiar from what we saw in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest of those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, you could say since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, right? Since we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him, underline that word, with him, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That word there is Harpazo, harpooned, Latin again, raptus, rapture, where we get the word rapture. It means to be taken by force. And by the way, it means that here in this context and in every other place that word appears, it means the exact same thing. Sometimes the, 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 uh, the scholars argue, say, well, here it means this and here it means that. Well, it means the exact same thing everywhere you see. Caught up, it means caught up. <laughs> We're going to be snatched, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall not be with, always, thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. Be encouraged with these words. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ to rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet them in, with the Lord in the air. Thus we shall be with forever with the Lord. The rapture of the church. A shout. That could be thunder. It could be something that's heard by all. It'll be a voice. Michael the archangel. He is the one who's called the, the archangel. Michael. Amazing. So how do we know, though, that these passages we just read don't refer to the day of the Lord? Is, is this, how do we know that this is saying that we're going to be on the other side, that we'll be on the other side of, of heaven, <laughs> we'll be with the Lord, 
during the Great Tribulation. Go to Revelation chapter 3. This is the message in Revelation that the Lord gave for John to write down to the seven churches. The seven churches are churches that existed at that time, and they're churches that have existed uh, as a type through our church history, and they're churches that exist today. Types of churches, verse 7 of Revelation 3. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write, He who is holy, he who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Wouldn't you love for that to be said of you? I would. You have kept my word. You have not denied my name. And we certainly acknowledge that we have little power, that he has all power. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them to come and bow down at your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing. Make a note of that. I will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have in order that no one takes your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go out from anywhere, from it anywhere. Pardon me. He will not go out from it anymore, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? The question here is, who are the ones who dwell on the earth during the Great Tribulation? If we're going to be those who come with the Lord at the day of the Lord, at the second coming, who are those who dwell on the earth? Revelation 8, verse 13. Let's look at these verses and we'll kind of pull it all together. So stay with me. Revelation 8, 13. And I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven saying with a loud voice, whoa, 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 to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. And we know that time period that's talking about there in Revelation 8 is the, during the Great Tribulation. The Lord is not going to say of his bride, his precious, beloved bride, woe to you, woe to you. Because there's great tribulation coming down on the earth dwellers, as we saw there in chapter 6, verse 10, those who dwell on the earth. Revelation 11, verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry. And they will send gifts to one another because the two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. The two prophets during the great tribulation period will be um, doing signs and wonders, leading many to Christ. Many will be saved during the tribulation period. You don't want to be here during the tribulation period. (laughs) You want to get saved before that time because it will be very hard to stand up for Christ. It will be a capital punishment, ending in death most likely, or at least torture. For those who receive Christ during the tribulation period. 
but those two prophets are going to be killed. And they will stand over and they will look at the bodies, not burying them at all. They'll look at the bodies for a few days. And then it says again in verse 10, those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over the two prophets and make merry. They'll send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. They tormented them with the truth. <laughs> they, they told them the truth. They told them about the, the grace of God and it was tormenting to them. And so they're going to have a, a, an actual celebration where they send gifts to one another. Happy Dead Prophets Day. I guess that's what they'll call it. Happy Dead Prophets Day. Here's a gift. You know, They're gone. They're finally quiet. We got, we got rid of them, right? So who are these earth dwellers during the time? These verses indicate it's not going to be us. Woe to them that dwell on the earth. Woe to those. And then it says those who are on the earth at the time are going to celebrate when the prophets die. That doesn't sound like those who know God. The earth dwellers are unsaved people who are raising their fists at God. Those are the earth dwellers. Chapter 5, Revelation. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, with the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Your prayers are gathered in heaven. And they turn to gold. They go into golden bowls. And they are incense, a sweet aroma before the Lord are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. Who's singing this song? Last part of verse 8. Last word in verse 8. What's it say? Saints, holy ones, redeemed, Christians, believers. They're the ones, we are the ones at this time will be singing the song. In heaven, <laughs> this is not on earth. This is a scene in heaven. When tribulation is being poured out and wrath of God is being poured onto the earth, we're singing the song, worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. For thou wast slain and didst purchased for God with thy blood, men from every tribe and every tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom of priests and they will reign upon the earth. The word there in verse 10, them, is also translated us. Thou hast made us to be. King James, New King James, and several other places it says, Thou hast made us to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and we will reign on the earth. Jesus' favorite name for himself, we saw here early in chapter 5. His favorite name for himself throughout the book of Revelation is Lamb of God. 20-something times he calls himself the Lamb of God. He wants us to remember what he remembers, that he has sacrificed himself once and for all. We can't add to his sacrifice and we can't take from it. 
what he has done for us. Again, verses 9 and 10. The only ones who can sing this song are those who are redeemed. Those who have been saved, who have been covered by the blood of Jesus. Again, them is better translated us. So they are speaking of their own redemption. And that would make us all pre-tribulationists. Stay with me. Pre-tribulation means that the Lord is taking us home at the beginning of the tribulation, before it starts, not during. Because this song is sung. And there was, there was a scholar who was a staunch post-tribulationist. He just liked to suffer, I guess. <laughs> And he read this passage, and he couldn't get away from it. He said, we're in heaven. And he caught himself in his own theology, and he said, wait a minute, we're in heaven. We're not on earth. We're in heaven during this time. And he changed his view, or God did. Listen to this. There are 230 Greek manuscripts, 230 different Greek manuscripts of the book of Revelation. 95 are the oldest, and thus, they say, the most authoritative. That would make sense, right? Less likelihood of a, of a transcriptionist error in writing and translating and, and rewriting the manuscripts. So 95 are the oldest and therefore the most authoritative. The skeptics say, but here's the thing. Only 23 of those 95 say the word us there in verse 10. So really, that could be saying them. Because, you know, this is saying they, they're up there, they are singing, and, and thou hast made them to be a kingdom. It doesn't say us. True. But they don't tell you that Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, those two verses that talk about the song of the saints in heaven, only show up in 24 of the 95 manuscripts. So 23 of the 24 manuscripts say us. I'll do that again. There are 230, 230 manuscripts of Revelation. 95 are the oldest and the most authoritative. The skeptics say, yeah, but only 23 of those 95 say us. Where here it says them. And these are my translation, it says them. True, but they don't tell you that Revelation 5, 9 through 10 doesn't even show up in most of those oldest manuscripts. It doesn't even show up. They leave that little detail out. Revelation 5, 9 through 10 only shows up in 24 of those 95 oldest manuscripts. And, and so, so 23 of those 24 say the word us. So we can pretty be pretty sure that it says us. The prologue in chapter 1 says us repeatedly in all 230 manuscripts. The Latin Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, one of the oldest um, non-original language versions, says us. Tyndale's Triumph is a, a book that you can go back to. Tyndale uh, is it's called the Tyndale's Triumph, the version, translation, says us. The Geneva Bible says us. The ancient Syriac says us. The King James Version says us. The New King says us. So you and I can have great confidence that Jesus Christ is coming for us <laughs> before the world falls apart. Yeah, but it seems like it's falling apart now. This is not the Great Tribulation. This is unrest. And I believe what this is also is people, hearts, being prepared to hear the truth of the gospel. God will do whatever it takes to save people. This should give us great encouragement in light of current events. Again, Revelation 3, verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing. The Lord tells us himself. I will keep you from the hour of testing. Here's the question. Are we expectant? Are we looking for our Lord? 
Are we expecting him to come and take us home at any moment? Are we sticking and are we um, staying true to the word? Or are we kind of thinking, yeah, I guess all roads might lead to heaven. I mean, God is nice after all. Be careful. Apostasy is very real. False teaching is very real. There's a departure. There is a falling away. I'm out of time. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Here we go. Jesus said in Luke, be ye like men who are looking for the Lord. <laughs> be like men who are looking people, boy, man, woman, boy, or girl, who are looking for the Lord. That's why the early church was always expectant. And if you look at how the letters um, in the New Testament finish, it's always looking, it's, there's always that anticipation. At the end of 1 Corinthians, we see Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. The early church would always say to each other, Maranatha, which means come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, come quickly. So here's the conclusion. You ready? So what? What do we do? Number one, what do we do? What are we supposed to do with this information? Is this just to make us understand in times? No. We need to respond in these ways. I got five things for you. Here we go. Number one, draw close to God. Draw close to God. Use this time, redeem this time to draw close to God. Start every day on your knees. Go boldly before the throne of grace and say, Lord, thank you for giving me the strength to live today. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, God, for an opportunity to be a witness for you. Go on your knees right when you get out of bed. Number two, forsake the things of this world that sideline your effectiveness as a soldier of Christ. These are times where the Lord is going to use us mightily. But if you want to be used mightily by God, you got to forsake and turn from those things that are sinful, even some things that are not really sinful, just, just as distractions, busyness. And get focused on him. Forsake the things of this world that sideline your effectiveness as the soldier of Christ. Draw close to God. Forsake the things of this world. Number three, focus more on the culture of heaven than on the culture of earth. Can I get an amen on that one? Focus more on the culture of heaven than on the culture of earth. Let us focus on vertical, not so much horizontal. Well, that means to stick my head in the sand? No, you can be aware of current events, but don't be so bogged down. I've talked to Christians who are so anxious, so fearful, brothers and sisters in Christ who are just so burdened. And I remind them, your God loves you. He wants to carry you through this. He doesn't want you to limp along through it. So focus more. And a lot of times, by the way, practically, that means turning off the TV, <laughs> turning it off, tune it out. It's like diet, garbage in, garbage out, right? So much of it isn't true anyway. Number four, run with endurance the race that we are in, keeping your eyes on Jesus. Run with endurance the race we are in, keeping your eyes on Jesus. Run the race, meaning even though it's hard, push through. Stay true to the truth. Stay true to the Lord. Pray. Spend time in the word. And finally, Romans 8. But in all things, we overwhelmingly conquer. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand and let's pray. And Lord, we thank you that you have called us by name. You have saved us already, saved us from this wicked and perverse generation. Positionally, we stand perfect in you. Practically, we are still here. We still battle with our minds. We we'll still battle with the things in this world that make us so angry and sad. But Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, for trusting in this world, in our resources, and in politics, and in government, and in, in our own wit and wisdom and cunning. May we trust in you alone. May we trust in you alone, Jesus. You loved us enough to save us. You also haven't changed since then. You still love us the same. 
He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete that work he began. Thank you, God, that you are and you will continue to be so faithful. Thank you, God. Now, Lord, take these truths that we've heard, plant them deep in our hearts, and may we honor you through our lives. As we look forward to you, Jesus, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.